Hello and welcome to Dialogue. The COVID-19 pandemic has been going on for two years and has changed life significantly. More than 5 million people worldwide have lost their lives to the coronavirus. Lockdown has become part of the world's common vocabulary and the governments and their citizens are still waiting for a new normal to emerge. Inequalities have deepened within countries and globally. How should we understand the world we live in through a historical lens? And what will the world be like a few years from now after this crisis has waned? To understand more, I'm honored to be joined by Jared Diamond, the Pulitzer Prize winning author of Gans, Germs and Steel, Upheaval and Collapse. That's our topic. I'm Xu Jinduo. Welcome to the show, Jared. Uh, your Pulitzer Prize-winning book, Gans, Germs and Steel, has been a global bestseller for 25 years. So what do you think is the biggest reason this book has been so popular? Well, let me say first that it's a pleasure for me to have this conversation with China, even though it's remotely. I'm sitting here in the study of my wife in our house in the city of Los Angeles, about two kilometers from my university and about 10 kilometers from Hollywood and about 12,000 kilometers from you. But it's still a pleasure to have this indirect connection. So my book, why is it a bestseller? And I think the reason is simple. My book is about guns, Germans and steel is about the biggest, most important question of history. And the answer to that question is a surprising answer. The biggest question of history is, why has history turned out differently for different peoples? Why are some countries rich and some countries poor? And often people answer that by saying, well, I can look at people's faces. Africans look different from Australians, look different from Asians, because people look different. Maybe that means that not only have they different appearances, but maybe they have different brains. And so possibly the reason why some countries are rich and other countries are poor is that people are smart and some countries are not in other countries. But a lot of effort has been made, particularly by racists in the United States, to try to recognize differences in intelligence between people, and they've never been able to recognize differences. It turns out, and this is the message of my book, that the different outcomes of history for different people have nothing to do with people's brains. It instead has to do with people's environments, and in particular, the plants and animals that were available to people in each part of the world to domesticate and grow and provide the basis for agriculture and herding. Uh, plants and animals, for example, China. Why did civilization begin early in China? Is it because Chinese people are smarter than other people? No, it's because China is the homeland of rice and water buffalo and pigs and chickens. But farming permits people to feed other people. And so with farming, you can get a big population, like in China today. And with farming, you can get food surpluses that can be used to feed emperors, as in China, and that can be used to feed inventors, as in China, and that can be used to feed scribes, inventors of writing, as in China. So agriculture was the starting point for the origin of these differences among people. Well, you know, the book has been around for 25 years. I mean, if you are, say, okay, uh, be able to do it again, is there anything you want to add or anything you want to change? Is there anything that I would want to change? Um, nothing major. There are things that I would up update in the book. For example, when I wrote Guns, Germs, and Steel in my early books, at that time, here's an interesting example. In China, are the Chinese people, people who arrived very recently within the last 50,000 years from Africa, or are the Chinese the descendants of people who were in China hundreds of thousands of years ago? We don't yet know the answer for sure, but we're starting to get some ideas of the answer. People in China today have one bone. Our skull is made of many different bones. And in China, there's one bone called the Inca bone that you have in China that we don't have in the United States. But Chinese skeletons of 400,000 years ago have an Inca bone, suggesting that the people in China include the inheritance of people in China hundreds of thousands of years ago. 
We didn't know that when I wrote Guns, Germs of Steel. So we've been learning some details, but the main conclusions are still the same. The main conclusions are still the same. Uh, you know, the new Chinese editions of your books, uh, like, uh, uh, you know, Against Germs and Steel, Collapse, The World Until Yesterday, and Upheaval, the new book, have been published or republished at the beginning of uh, 2022. So what does it mean to you? Is there anything special you want to say to the Chinese readers? Absolutely. First, I'm delighted that my books are being republished in China. Initially, when my book, Guns, Germs, and Steel, was first published in 1997, it had big sales in the United States and low sales in China, and sales gradually began in other countries. In Turkey, of all places, in Turkey, Guns, Germs, and Steel became a bestseller. Why? Because in Guns, Germs, and Steel, I talk about the origins of agriculture, but our agriculture began in southeastern Turkey. And so Turks are delighted to see Turkey appear in Guns, Germs, and Steel. Then Korea. Sales of my book exploded in Korea. Why? Because it became reported that the book most often checked out of the library of Seoul National University in Korea is Guns, Germs, and Steel. And so people in Korea began buying Guns, Germs, and Steel. In China, recently, sales of my book have exploded in China. And it looks as if while sales in China have not yet caught up to sales in the United States, they're catching up. And I think pretty soon sales in China are going to exceed sales in the United States. So I'm delighted about that. What do I want to say, especially to Chinese readers, um, that China is an important country. And in Guns, Germs, and Steel, you learn about why China has progressed so rapidly, but you also learn about how China influenced other parts, adjacent parts of the world. You learn about the influence of China on Vietnam and Cambodia. And you learn about why the people of the Philippines and of Indonesia and even of Polynesia look like the people of southern China because they derive from southern China. So what I hope the Chinese readers will get from my book will be not only the excitement of world history, but also learning something about China itself and about why China has been so influential. Yeah, that, that's really, I mean, people get better informed, to say the least, by reading your book. And also, uh, you know, in your book, the major theme is uh, geography. Uh, geography plays a very important role in shaping history. Uh, like uh, Eurasia, uh, because of this uh, large band of, uh, uh, you know, this land, uh, which makes it uh, easier to spread, uh, you know, knowledge, technologies, uh, and of course, livestock, etc. Uh, but today, with this globalization, with, you know, information age, internet, <laughs> you know, mobile phones, uh, uh, planes, do you think geography still plays a very important role in today's world? Do I think that geography still plays a role in this world? One might think geography no longer plays any role because here you and I are talking to each other yes. 12,000 kilometers apart and we have the internet. So people often think geography makes no more difference today, but just look at a map of the world and mark the countries that are rich and mark the countries that are poor and you'll see geography still has an enormous importance. For example, countries that do not have a seacoast tend to be poor, Laos. Why is Laos one of the poorer countries of Southeast Asia? Because it doesn't have a seacoast. Or in Africa, of the 48 countries of Africa, 16 of them have no seacoast, and they tend to be the poorest countries of Africa. Or in South America, Bolivia is the only country of South America that has no seacoast and is not on a navigable river. But Bolivia is the poorest country of, of South America. So geography is still important today. Of the countries of the world, um, the co countries that have improved their standard of living most recently are countries that have taken account of their geography. For example, Singapore. Singapore, 70 years ago, was not a rich country. Today, Singapore is a rich country. Why? Because Singapore recognized the importance of geography. Singapore recognized that they're in the tropics. So Singapore is not going to be a great exporter of food. The countries that are big exporters of food are countries like Canada and the United States and the Netherlands in cool, mild climates. 
So Singapore, instead of trying to become a food exporter, became instead a financial center, center and a trade link. Conversely, Argentina, Argentina is a country with wonderful geography. Argentina has the Pampas, that plain that is wonderful for growing wheat, and Argentina exports lots of wheat and lots of meat. But Argentina has thrown away its geographic advantages. Why? Because Argentina, for a long time, has had one bad government after another bad government. And so Argentina has thrown away its geographic advantages, while Singapore has taken advantage of its geographic advantages, all of which means geography is still important today. Uh, well, I love your idea that geography is important, but it's not a determinant uh, in terms of a country's development, you know, rise and fall of nations. Uh, you also mentioned in your theory, you know, it is a fallacy to assume that all societies will adopt to innovations uh, promptly. Uh, so if you look, take a look at today's world, you know, what uh, are you, do you think, you know, countries uh, will adopt uh, innovations, new innovations, you know, immediately uh, because of uh, cultural preferences, because of values, because of bias, they will not do that. We can think of some specific examples, and then we can think of the whole world. As a specific example, think of, think of Japan. When guns, when gunpowder was developed in China, and then guns spread to Europe, when the first Portuguese travelers came to Japan, they had a gun. And a duck, a bird flew overhead. The Portuguese shot that duck. The Japanese were very impressed. They bought the gun, they learned how to make the gun, and within a century, Japan had the most and the best guns in the world. But then Japan resisted and threw away guns with the result that 150 years ago, when the West was expanding with their guns, Japan was not prepared to resist the West. Today, as for still resisting um, innovation, Japan has this very complicated writing system I have Japanese relatives, so my wife has Japanese cousins. And I look, hear from my Japanese relatives about the difficulty that Japanese have learning Japanese writing. Uh, Japanese children do not, are not able to learn to read the newspaper until they're about 13 years old. Whereas my sons, with the alphabetical writing, my sons were reading the newspaper when they're six years old. And yet Japan has simple writing systems called um, called Kira, Hataka, Hirakana and Katakana, the Japanese could easily adopt the simple writing system. Why don't they? Because Japanese writing is beautiful, and the Japanese are so attached to their beautiful writing system that they would rather have their beautiful writing and make children spend eight years learning to write, whereas they could learn to write in six months. Uh, well, you have been writing about, you know, against uh, germs and the steel germs, um, you know, which played a very important role in history, in shaping our history, in shaping, you know, a country, a people, their fate, their future. Uh, what do you think about this uh, current pandemic? Uh, you know, what way it will impact uh, uh, the world? How will the epidemic impact the world? Um, it's not going to impact, um, it's not going, well, well, COVID is a tragedy. I would be the last person to belittle the tragedy. Two days ago, one of my wife's and my closest friends died of COVID. And we, and at this moment, my niece and her husband and her children, the four of them all have COVID. So I know about the tragedy of COVID. But the reality is that COVID compared to the diseases of the past is not a big killer. Only about 2% of people infected with COVID die of COVID. Whereas in the case of smallpox, which has been eliminated, or plague, people who are not treated, about 50% of people who were infected with smallpox or plague died of smallpox and plague. And then AIDS, everybody infected with AIDS dies of AIDS. And Ebola in Marburg, 70% die of Ebola in Marburg. So, so um, COVID is not a serious disease as is true of the disease of the past. What is serious about COVID is how we are reacting to it. If some countries are selfish and protect themselves against COVID and other countries are unable to protect themselves against COVID or choose not to protect themselves against COVID, there are going to be differences around the world. There is going to be more inequality and people in infected countries are going to get angry and desperate 
and people in uninfected countries are going to feel safe and they are going to be targets of anger from infected countries. So my concern about COVID um, is not so much that it will kill lots of people. It will not kill lots of people. My concern is that it may make the world more unequal than it is now. Let's have a break. We'll continue our discussion right after this. Welcome back. Speak of like how we, our response, you know, how we responded to the pandemic. Um, I think you listed like a full existential threat to human being. You know, one of them, of course, nuclear weapons, easy to understand. Climate change, you know, how we use our resources and also inequality. You mentioned inequality. Because of the pandemic, inequalities actually, you know, within a country, in many countries, I would say also around the world, is getting uh, deepened. Are you worried about that, you know, with this pandemic, you know, a lot of countries, you know, economic recovery will be a challenge. And of course, this, uh, this pandemic challenge is not over yet. Uh, in particular, those developing countries, uh, probably that will be some upheaval, you know, change of government or even uh, chaos over there. Yes, of course. Uh, yes, I'm worried about the, the pandemic. Um, rich countries are better able to vaccinate their citizens than our, our poor countries. The, I have a best case scenario and a worst case scenario. My best case scenario is that countries with vaccines, China and the United States and European countries will share their vaccines with other countries. My worst case, in that case, other countries um, will not get poorer. My worst case scenario is that countries with vaccines will not share their vaccines with countries like African countries and some Asian countries that do not have their own vaccines. And that means that poor countries will get poorer, but already it's a big threat to world stability to have poor countries and rich countries together in this globalized world. We in the United States know particularly about that because think of the World Trade Center attack in 2001 when terrorists from poor countries uh, launched planes into the World Trade Center. That showed that the United States, the United States is no longer protected by the oceans from poor countries. In this globalized world, poor countries have ways of sharing their anger with richer countries. And that's true for the United States, but it's also true for China and it's also true for European countries. So my hope would be that COVID will encourage the world to cooperate and my worst case scenario is that COVID will make the world more unequal than it is now. Uh, well, uh, to change the, the gear a little bit, you know, in your book, uh, recent book, Upheaval, you mentioned about, uh, you know, the, uh, the ways the you know, different nations address their crisis. So, you know, they needed to acknowledge the problem, take a responsibility and learn from other models, adjust them accordingly, etc. Uh, there were some outcome predictors. I want to you know, take a look at, uh, you know, your country, the United States, you know, um, how do you characterize the challenges right now for the U.S.? Wow. Uh, um, upheaval for my, my book, Upheaval for the United States. In my book, Upheaval, I had two chapters about the United States, my own country. Why? Because the United States has advantages, geographic advantages like Argentina, and I'm worried that my country will throw away its geographic advantages. In the United States, what we call polarization, the breakdown of agreement in the United States, the breakdown of agreement between our political parties is getting worse and worse. Um, it's the worst that it has been in my lifetime. So I'm worried about the United States. When I look to countries that have dealt with their crises, that have been honest in dealing with their crises. A country that has done very well in dealing with crises is the European country of Finland. Finland is that Scandinavian country that lies between Russia on the east and Sweden on the west. Finland, I visited Finland a fair number of times, and one friend of mine in Finland um, told me that he is on a, a Finnish government commission. Finland has a government commission that meets every month and thinks about what crises might happen. The Finnish government tries to think of everything that could go wrong, and they plan for everything that could go wrong. So for example, when I visited my Finnish friend with my wife about two years ago, he had just been to the monthly meeting, 
in that monthly meeting was about what would Finland do if Finland's electricity net broke down? How can Finland prepare for an electricity broke, breakdown? Well, because Finland every month thinks about everything that could go wrong. Three years ago, that monthly meeting discussed what would happen if we have an epidemic in Finland. And if we have an epidemic in Finland, it might be a respiratory disease epidemic. We need face masks. So obviously we have to stockpile face masks. The Finns stockpile face masks. They stockpile wheat. They stockpile, they stockpile fuel. They stockpile medicines. They stockpile chemicals. And the result was that when the pandemic of COVID hit, the United States did not have face masks, but Finland did have face masks. And so the Finns were prepared and the United States was not prepared. Finland is an example of a country that prepares for any crisis because of its history. In World War II, it was cut off from the outside world, and the Finns learned that they had to be prepared to deal with anything in isolation. So, you know, do you think the U.S. government or the country as a whole uh, is handling the crisis uh, well based on this, uh, you know, outcome predictors? Is the United States handling, uh, handling the crisis of COVID well or the crisis of polarization? Well, which That's a polarization, let's say. Polarization. Um, in the United States, um, some people are dealing well with polarization and trying to reduce it, and lots of people are doing badly with polarization and making it worse. Um, one of, for example, in the United States, unfortunately, um, there are many American states that are introducing laws, policies that make it difficult for people to vote who are likely to vote for the other party. Mostly it's Republicans that are doing this, but it's also Democrats that are doing this. But the essence of democracy is being able to vote. And so polarization is going to increase um, if people are um, prevented from, from voting. The, the, this is an interesting point. The strength of a democracy is that you can tell the government you are doing a bad job. We've seen this in American history. Uh, the United States, um, about what, 45 years ago, the United States made war in Vietnam. The government of the United States decided to make war in Vietnam. Many Americans thought that that was a bad idea. And they protested. And the government was angry at them. And the government actually shot for the students who were protesting. But the protested, protested so much that eventually the American government was forced to get out of the war with Vietnam. Well, in your uh, Gans, Germs, and the Steel, the book, you explored the reasons you know, why China lost its technological lead to Europe. Uh, you referred to policy changes in the Ming Dynasty that put an end to the Chinese uh, treasure fleets. And you said that decision was irreversible since no one would argue if it was right or not. How can a country in general you know, avoid these uh, irreversible consequences of bad decisions? You know, what's needed to counteract bad decisions? How can a com country avoid uh, bad decisions? Um, th there, is, there is no way that a country can avoid bad decisions making some bad decision, but what a country can do is to, to correct bad decisions. For example, in the United States with COVID, initially there were some very bad decisions made about COVID. Um, our recent president, President Trump, initially he denied the, the reality of COVID. And then he said the way to treat COVID is to inject bleach into your veins and various other silly things. So those were bad decisions. But, but fortunately, there were Americans who spoke against the bad decision. And eventually, those bad decisions got corrected. Um, another example, um, so Australia uh, initially made some bad decisions. And then Australia got frightened by the arrival of COVID in Australia. And the Australian government changed its policy, all of which is a long-winded way of saying that every country's make bad decisions. Um, China has made bad decisions in the past. The United States has made bad decisions in the past. Europe has made bad decisions in the past. What's important is to be able to correct those bad decisions. So uh, the ability to correct, um, you know, if you look at the fall and rise of nations, in particular the big nations around the world, uh, um, so even, I mean, for a country, they have the ability to self-correct, for example, uh, to sustain. 
uh, but the, the still there will be a rise and a fall. Uh, it's like almost like a natural law for any countries or for you know individual people. We we grew, we grow old and then you know we from young. So uh, how can any country resist that kind of law? How can a country resist that kind of law? And is it the case that the countries inevitably grow old? Um, one often hears people say that it's a natural trend for countries to go through cycles and grow old. I don't believe that. The countries don't necessarily go through cycles. There are some countries that have advantages. There are some countries that have geographic advantages. Um, yes, they can throw away those geographic advantages. Or take China as another example. China has advantages. China has big geographic advantages. It's a big country. It's a country that has been unified for the last 2,200 years. Is it the case that it's inevitable that China will rise and then fall again? No, it's not inevitable. It depends entirely upon China's policies and whether the United States rises or declines. It depends entirely on America's policy. That's why in my book, Upheaval, I had an entire chapter on the things that I'm concerned with the United States may be doing wrong so that I can motivate Americans to stop doing bad things and to start doing good things. So why is policy making very important over there? Uh, well, lastly, you said that the best outcome of our current crisis would be for it to create a widespread sense of a world identity, you know, to make all people recognize that we now face the common enemy of global problems that can be solved only by a united global effort. Uh, how optimistic are you about that? I'm cautiously optimistic. By cautiously optimistic, what I mean is that I see the chances that at least 51% that we will solve our problems. And I see the chances as only 49% that we will fail to solve our problems. What it depends upon, it depends particularly upon the relations between China and the United States, and also the relations between China, the United States, India, Japan, and the European Union. Those are the five most powerful entities in the world. Those five countries or entities, they control something like 60% of the economy of the world. China cannot solve climate change by itself. The United States cannot solve climate change by itself. China and the United States, unfortunately, there is competition. But the fact is that the future of China and the future of the United States depend upon cooperation between the China and the United States. If China and the United States will cooperate to solve the problems of climate change, and if China and the United States will cooperate to solve problems of resource depletion, to solve the problems of overfishing and overexploiting of the world's forests and loss of soil, you and China have problems of soil being washed out to the ocean. We in the United States have problems of soil being washed out to the ocean. So if China and the United States compete with each other, then I am pessimistic about the future of the world. If China and the United States will recognize that the only way that your country and my country will have a secure future is to start cooperating and solving the problems that both you and we face, then I'm optimistic. And I would say the chances are better than 51 percent. If China and the United States would cooperate, the chances are 99 percent that the world will have a happy future. So cooperation is a much, much better choice for the world and also for China and the U.S. Well, thank you, Jerry. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your insights. Thank you for talking with us. With that, we come to the end of today's show. I'm Xu Qinzhuo. See you next time.